Okay, no thank no 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 nothing. Okay, let me just try to start my presentation. Okay, my paper is about energy, uh, Islamic extremism, and Korea. And let me start with my main argument. Okay, um, South Korea's relations with the world beyond Northeast Asia, and especially with the Middle East, uh, has been traditionally confined only to the economy interest. And energy is the ties that bind Korea and the Gulf states. And for 60 years, Korea's Middle East policy has been based on passive hedging, which is a strategy of neutrality and wait and see. But um, Korea needs more uh, uh, active, norm-driven Middle East policy for uh, those three reasons. First, instability in the Middle East direct damages Korea's economic interest. Second, supporting Middle Eastern countries in their challenges gains their support in dealing with our problem, I mean, which is North Korea. And finally, enforcing key global norms enhances Korea's reputation as a pr pr principled international actor and lays the foundation of uh, unification of Korean Peninsula. So let me start with the economic situation between uh, Korea and the Middle East. As I said before, Korea's economic interests in the Middle East are really huge. You know, like 87% of oil and 53% of gas and 62% of construction uh, contracts, which is worth uh, $20 billion, come from the Middle East. And also there is a considerable history of economic um, cooperation and um, very strong ties between Korea and the Gulf states. During the uh, 1970s, President then uh, Park Jong-hee tried to create the first Middle East boom, sending uh, South Korean construction workers to the Gulf states with lots of oil money, and switched the oil crisis then into opportunity for Korea. And the construction project initiated under uh, Park Jong-hee government provided the seed capital and made a great contribution to Korea's economic growth. And I am talking about the first Middle East boom during the 70s under the Korean development uh, state led by President Park Jong-hee. And the current President Park Geun-hye, like her father, tries to initiate the second Middle East boom and implement the sales diplomacy. However, due to the continuing drop in uh, oil prices, sectors like construction, shipbuilding, and plant building, which are highly dependent upon the oil revenues of the Gulf states face difficulties. And now I'm trying to uh, switch the gear to more security and politics issue between Korea and the Middle East. And I'm trying to uh, introduce a uh, new proposition of Korea as middle power Okay, given the capacity, including GDP, population, defense spending, the number of troops, internet users, and trade volumes, and education level, Korea is kind of, you know, middle power. But uh, the actions, I mean, in a global level, and responsibility of Korea is not really, you know, following that capacity. It's not really, you know, enough yet. Okay, Korea has pursued the middle power foreign policy to promote international norms and mediate the uh, dispute. And for the last couple of years, Korean government has provided about $40 million to help Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and Yemen. And similarly, uh, Korea has granted the humanitarian status of 620 Syrian refugees to reside in Korea and taken part in the anti-ISIS coalition, it has paid one million, one million U.S. dollars. It's not that big. That's I'm mumbling. To the stabilization working group, and Tonghe in Korea, uh, Bulusi in Korean naval unit is participating in the international anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden, and Dongbyeong unit is conducting uh, reconstruction activities 
its kind of uh, PKO activity in Lebanon. And especially regarding you know, ISIS, Korea, and the international community issue, our foreign minister uh, considered, to visit, uh, considered the visit to Baghdad and Erbil to support the Iraqi and Kurdish government, especially because Koreans have um, like a strong military legacy because we send the third largest troops to Iraq, I mean, in general, and the KRJ Kurdish regional uh, government in year 2003 uh, during the Iraq war. It's not really something to uh, boost. But um, however, the 2015 Japanese hostage killing by ISIS, despite Japanese limited role as a humanitarian uh, aid provider, raised a counter argument within Korean society. Okay, don't mess with the terrorist argument is emerging against pursuing middle power foreign policy and following international norms. You know, of course, protecting the safety of Koreans abroad is one of the foreign ministry's key tasks. But there's really no direct causal relationship between adhering to international norms and being a target of terrorism. And a passive diplomatic posture and protecting its own uh, citizens. But as uh, some of you might know that we have uh, lots of like bad and sad experience like uh, that terrorists attacked the Korean citizens in year 2004, seven, nine, and uh, two years ago. Um, so what I wanted to say is that there is a new norm of terrorism. I mean, by 2015, 65 countries, um, including Korea, had joined the anti-ISIS international coalition. And Korea is among 30 countries who pledge the humanitarian assistance but airstrikes on ISIS re remain inefficient because the coalition forces have different you know, target priorities. They have very different purposes and conflict interests. So a new normal of enduring instability in the region will continue, given that key players at both global and local levels have conflict interests and different strategic priorities. However, um, I think that those leaderless jihadists will fade away but never die. Indeed, the ISIS subnetworks operate more autonomously these days in their day-to-day -day operations. So the new normal of terrorism is like the interactive exchanges in radical-driven you know, chat rooms continue to serve as an echo chamber effect through a process of self-selecting and fina uh, finally radicalize young Muslims collectively. Okay, so that's our new normal. <laughs> However, I think that eventually, ISIS will deteriorate into a mi marginalized group with a scattered networks launching spread terrorist attacks against democracy, which make more feasible target due to their open systems and their obligation to protect their own citizens. So, so what's the implications of all these, you know, ISIS, the international community, Korea as a middle power, and who are still very dependent upon uh, the Middle East energy? I think that Korea tends to lose significant standing if it adopts a more passive and economic interest-driven policy. Unless Korea consistently upholds international norms and principles, it will encounter setbacks in finding international support in dealing with North Korea. So, you know, again, the, a new number of terrorism. I mean, we, we need to deal with that. I mean, we cannot really get away from those terrorist attacks. I mean, terrorists want to capture the public's attention anyway, and democracies are very vulnerable to such attack in a short term. So, for Korea, implementing middle power foreign policy may incur short-term costs, but eventually it will serve Korea's long-term national interest by winning international support and uh, trust 
for our uh, peaceful unification. And the North Korea, I mean, the North Korea regime continues to play a destabilizing role in the Middle East, including missile and conventional weapon sales and sending military advisors, oil smuggling, and cooperation on nuclear technology research. And what I wanted to emphasize is that given that the North Korean threat is not really only limited to Northeast Asia, more active roles of Western and Middle Eastern countries, I mean, in, and also like of India in dealing with North Korea are really critically needed. So again, that, this is the end of my presentation. And thank you so much. Thank you.